I'm here for chapter 11. Papa arrived back from Paris on Sunday, so Anna and Max went to meet him in Zurich with Mama. It was a cool, bright day in early October, and as they came back with him on the steamer, they could see some new snow on the mountains. Papa was very cheerful. He had enjoyed being in Paris. Although he had stayed in a scruffy little hotel to save money, he had eaten delicious food and drunk lots of good wine. All these things were cheap in France. The editor of the Daily Parisian had been very nice and Papa had also spoken to the editor of several French newspapers. They too had said that they wanted him to write for them. In French, asked Anna. Of course, said Papa. He had had a French governess when he was small and could speak French as well as he spoke German. Are we all going to live in Paris then? asked Max. Mama and I must talk about it first, said Papa, but he clearly thought that they should. How lovely, said Anna. Nothing's been decided yet, said Mama. There may be two there may be possibility in, possibilities in London too. Well, it's damp there, said Anna. Mama got quite cross. Nonsense, she said. You don't know anything about it. The trouble was that Mama did not speak French much. While Papa had learned French from his French governess, Mama had learned English from an English governess. The English governess had been so nice that Mama had always wanted to see the country she came from. We'll talk about it, said Papa. Then he told them about the people he had met, old acquaintances from Berlin, who had been distinguished writers, actors or scientists, and were now trying to eke out a living in France. One morning I ran into the actor. You remember Blue... Blumenthal, said Papa, and Mama knew at once whom he meant. He's opened a cake shop. His wife bakes the cakes and he serves behind the counter. I met him delivering apple strudel to a special customer. Papa smiled. The last time I had seen him, he was the guest of honour at a banquet in the Berlin Opera. He had also met a French journalist and his wife, who had invited him several times to their home. They are delightful people, said Papa, and they have a daughter about Anna's age. If we go and live in Paris, I'm sure you will like them enormously. Yes, said Mama, but she did not sound convinced. For the next week or two, Mama and Papa talked about Paris. Papa thought that he would be able to work there and that it would be a lovely place to live. Mama, who hardly knew Paris, had all sorts of practical considerations like the children's education and what sort of a home they would find, to which Papa had not given much thought. In the end, they agreed that she must go back to Paris with Papa and see for herself. After all, it was a very important decision. What about us? asked Max. He and Anne, Anna were sitting on the bed in their, grand in their parents' room when they had been summoned for the discussion. Mama had only had the only chair and Papa was pre perched like a rather elegant goblin on an upturned suitcase. It was a bit cramped, but more, but more private than downstairs. I think you're old enough to look after yourself for a few weeks, said Mama. You mean we'd stay here on our own, asked Anna. It seemed an extraordinary idea. Why not, said Mama. For Fr Frau Schoen will keep an eye on you. She'll see that your clothes are clean and that you go to bed at the right time. I think you can manage the rest yourself. So it was settled. Anna and Max went, were to send their parents a postcard every other day to let them know that everything was all right and Mama and Papa would do the same. Mama asked them to remember to wash their necks and put on clean socks. Papa had something more serious to say to them. Remember that when Mama and I are in Paris, you will be the only representatives 
of our family in Switzerland, he said. It's a big responsibility. Why? asked Anna. What will we have to do? Once at the Berlin Zoo with Uncle Julius, she had seen a small mouse like creature with the nose on its cage, claiming that it was the only representative of its species in Germany. She hoped no one was going to come and, and stare at her and Max. But this was not what Papa had meant at all. There are Jews scattered all over the world, he said, and the Nazis are telling terrible lies about them. So it's very important for people like us to, pro to prove them wrong. How can we? asked Max. By being better than other people, said Papa. For instance, the Nazis say that Jews are dishonest. So it's not enough for us to be as honest as anyone else. We have to be more honest. Anna at once thought guilty, felt guilty of the last time she had bought a special pencil in Berlin. The man in the paper shop had not charged her quite enough and Anna had not pointed out his mistake. Suppose the Nazis got, her, got found out about this. We have to be more hard-working than other people, said Papa, to prove that we're not lazy. More generous to prove that we're not mean. More polite to prove that we're not rude. Max nodded. It may seem like a lot to ask, said Papa, but I think it's worth it because the Jews are wonderful people. And it's rather splendid to be one. And when Mama and I come back, I'm sure we'll be very proud of the way you have represented us in Switzerland. It was funny, thought Anna. Normally she hated to be told that she must be extra good. But this time she did not really mind. She had not thought about this before and she had realised how important being Jewish was. Secretly, she resolved really to really to wash her neck with soap each day while Mama was away so that at least the Nazis would not be able to say that Jews had dirty necks. However, when Mama and Papa actually left for Paris, she did not feel important at all, just rather small and forlorn. She managed not to cry while she was watching their train pull out of the local station, but as she and Max walked back slowly to the inn, she felt quite clearly that she was too young to be left in one country while her parents went to a different one. Come on, little man, said Max suddenly. Cheer up. And it was so funny to be addressed as little man, which was what people sometimes called Max, that she laughed. After this, things got better. Frau, Frau Schwern had cooked her favourite lunch and it was rather grand for her and Max to eat in the dining room, at the table, all by themselves. Then Brenly came to collect her for, for afternoon school, and after school she and Max played with the, with the three Schroen children, just as usual. Bedtime, which she, which she had thought would be the worst bit, was actually quite nice, because Herr Schroen came in and told them funny stories about some of the people who came to the inn. Next day, she and Max were able to write quite a cheerful postcard to Mama and Papa and one arrived for them from Paris the following morning. After this life went along quite briskly, the postcards were a great help. Each day they either wrote to Mama and Papa or heard from them and this made it feel as though Mama and Papa were not far away. On Sunday, Anna and Max and the three Schwern children went into the woods to collect sweet chestnuts. They brought back great baskets full and Frau Schwern roasted them in the oven. Then they all ate them for supper in, in the Schwern's. Kitchen's kitchen spread thickly with butter. They were delicious. At the end of the second week after Mama and Papa's departure, Herr Graup took Anna's class on an ex execution into the mountains. They spent the night high up on the mountainside, 
sleeping on straw in a wooden hut, and in the morning her gramp got them up before it was light. He walked them along the narrow path up the mountain, and suddenly Anna found that the ground under her feet had become cold and wet. It was snow. Look, she cried, and as they looked at the snow, which had been dimly grey in the darkness, suddenly became brighter and pinker. It happened quite quickly, and soon a rosy brilliance swept across the entire mountainside. Anna looked at Renly. Her blue sweater had turned purple, her face was scarlet, and even her, her mouse-coloured plaits glowed orange. The other children were equally transformed. Even Herr Grout's beard had turned pink. And behind them was a huge empty expanse of deep pink snow and slightly paler pink sky. Gradually the pink faded a little and the light became brighter. The pink world became behind Renly and the rest divided itself into blue sky and dazzling white snow and it was fully daylight. You have now see, seen the sunrise in the Swiss mountains. The most beautiful sight in the world, said Herr Graup, as though he, he personally had caused it to happen. Then he marched them all down again. It was a long walk and Anna was tired, was tired long before they got to the bottom. In the train on the way back, she dozed and wished that Mama and Papa were not in Paris so that she could tell them about her adventure. But perhaps there would soon be news from of their return. Mama had promised that they would only stay away three weeks at the most and it was now a little more than two. They did not get back to the inn until evening. Max had held back the regular postcard of the day and, tired as she was, Anna managed to cram a lot on it about her excursion. Then, although it was only seven o'clock, she went to bed. On her way upstairs, she came upon Franz and Verilia whispering together in the corridor. When she saw, when they saw her, they stopped. What were you saying? asked Anna. She had caught her father's name and something about the Nazis. Nothing, they said. Yes, you were, asked, said Anna. I heard you. Pa said we weren't to tell you for fear of upsetting you. But it was in the paper. The Nazis are putting a price on your pa's head. A, pri a price on his head? asked Anna stupidly. Yes, said Franz. A thousand German marks. Pa says it shows how important your pa must be. There was a picture of him and all. How do you put a thousand marks on a person's head? It was silly. She determined, she was determined to ask Max when he came up to bed but fell asleep long before. In the middle of the night, Anna woke up. It was quite sudden, like something being switched on inside her head, and she was immediately wide awake. And as though she had been thinking of something else all night, she suddenly knew with terrible clarity how you put a thousand marks on a person's head. In her mind, she saw a room. It was a funny looking room because it was in France, and the ceiling, instead of being solid, was a mass of crisscrossing beams. In the gaps between them, something was moving. It was dark, but now the door opened and the light came on. Papa was coming to bed. He took a few steps towards the middle of the room. Don't! Anna wanted to cry. Then the terrible shower of heavy coins began. It came pouring down from the ceiling onto the Papa's head. He called out, but the coins kept coming. He sank to his knees under the weight of all the coins, but they kept falling and falling 
until he was completely buried under them. So this was what Herr Schwerin had, want, had not wanted her to know. This was what the Nazis were going to do to Papa. Or perhaps, since it was in the paper, they had already done it. She lay staring into the darkness, sick with fear. In the upper bed, she could hear Max breathing quietly and regularly. Should she wake him? But Max hated being disturbed in the night. He would probably only be cross and say that, that it was all nonsense. And perhaps it was all nonsense. She thought with a sudden lightening of her heart. Perhaps in the morning she would be able to see it as one of those silly night fears which had frightened her when she was, was young. Like the time when she had thought that the house was on fire or that her heart had stopped. In the morning there would be the usual postcard from Mama and Papa and everything would be all right. Yes, but this was not coming from her imagination. It had been in the paper. Her thoughts went round and round. One moment she was making complicated plans to get up, take the train to Paris and warn Papa. The next moment she thought how silly she'd look if Frau, if Frau Schwern should happen to catch her. In the end, she must have fallen asleep because suddenly it was daylight and Max was already half-dressed. She stayed in bed for a moment, feeling very tired and letting the thoughts of the previous night come creeping back. After all, they seemed rather unreal now that it was morning. Max, she said tentatively. Max had an open textbook on the table beside him and was looking at it while he put on his shoes and socks. Sorry, said Max. Latin exam today and I haven't revised. He went back to his book, murmuring verbs and tenses. Anyway, it didn't matter, thought Anna. She was sure everything was all right. But at breakfast, there was no postcard from Mama and Papa. Why do you think it hasn't come? She asked Max. Postal delays, said Max. Threw a mouth of bread, mouthful of bread. Bye, and he rushed off to catch his train. I dare say it will come this afternoon, said Hirschwern. But she worried about it all day at school and sat chewing her pencil instead of writing a description of the sunrise in the mountainside. What's the matter with you? asked Herr Group. She usually wrote the best com compositions in the class. It was beautiful. You should have been inspired by that by the experience. And he walked away, personally offended by her lack of response to his sunrise. There was still no postcard when she came home from school, nor was there anything in the in the last post at seven o'clock. It was the first time that Mama and Papa had not written. Anna managed to get through the supper thinking cool thoughts about postal delays, but once she was in bed with the lights out and all the terrors of the previous night came flooding back with such force that she felt almost choked by it. She tried to remember that she was a Jew and must not be frightened. Otherwise, the Nazis would say that all Jews were cowards. But it was no use. She kept seeing the room with the strange ceiling and the terrible rain of coins coming down on Papa's head. Even though she shut her eyes and, and buried her face in her pillow, she could still see it. She must have been making some noise in bed, for Max suddenly said, What's the matter? Nothing, said Anna. But even as she said it, she could feel something like a small explosion making its way up from her stomach towards her throat and suddenly she was sobbing. Papa, Papa! And Max was sitting on her bed and patting her arm. Oh, you idiot, he said, when she had explained her fears. Don't you know what is meant by a price on someone's head? Not, not what I thought, said Anna. 
No, said Max. Not at all what you thought. Putting a price on a person's head means offering a reward to anyone who captures that person. There you are, well Anna. The Nazis are trying to get Papa. Well, in a way, said Max. But Herr Schwern didn't think it was it was very serious. After all, there's not much they can do about it. Papa isn't in Germany. You think he's all right? Of course he's all right. We'll have a postcard in the morning. But supposing they sent someone after him in France? A kidnapper or something like that? Then Papa would then Papa would have the whole of the French police forced to protect him. Max assumed what he imagined to be a French accent. Go away, please. Is not allowed to kidnap in France. We chop off your head with the guillotine, no? He was such an awful mimic that Anna had to laugh and Max looked surprised at his success. Better go to sleep now, he said. And she was so tired that very soon she did. In the morning, instead of a postcard, they had a long letter. Mama and Papa had decided that they should all live in Paris together and Papa was going to collect them. Papa, said Anna, after the first excitement of seeing him safe and, and sound. Papa, I was a bit upset when I heard about the price on your head. So was I, said Papa, very upset. Where are you? asked Anna. Surprised? Papa had always seemed so brave. Well, it's such a very small price, exclaimed Papa. A thousand marks goes nowhere these days. I think I'm worth a lot more, don't you? Yes, said Anna, feeling better. No self-respecting kidnapper would touch it, said Papa. He shook his head sadly. I've a good mind to write to Hitler and complain. See you, bye.